In the previous video, we talked about the zeroth law of thermodynamics, the idea of internal energy, and the idea of heat being the transfer of energy or the flow of energy due to a temperature difference. Well, one of the first things that was studied in order to understand thermodynamics was gases. Gases were very pure so that you could get a very clean substance that you knew about it. Uh, it was easy to work with. You could study the properties. When you heat it, there are great changes in the properties. So we're going to study gas laws and what was experimentally determined in the 1617s and 1800s. In doing this, we were looking at systems that are in equilibrium or more precisely in thermodynamic equilibrium. Now what we really mean by that is that the system is in an equilibrium state. And a system is said to be in an equilibrium state if when you heat it or put it under pressure or do anything, you do it slowly enough so that whatever disturbance you cause has a chance to be transferred throughout the system. For instance, let's say that we're heating the bottom of this pan that contains these gas molecules that are moving all around. The energy is transferred first to the atoms that are closest to the bottom of the pan. And we said earlier that there appears to be some connection between the average energy of a molecule and this idea of temperature. As we give them this energy and these guys pick up speed, they will bang around and eventually that energy will be transferred throughout the material. By saying that it is in thermodynamic equilibrium, we mean that we're going to do this process slowly enough that if we measure the temperature here, we in, for instance, got 30 degrees C, and we measured it here, we got 30 degrees C, and if we measured it here, we got 30 degrees C, that there would be some specific temperature, and no matter where we measured it, we'd get the same. Thus, it makes sense to talk about the temperature of a gas. If every point in the gas is at a different temperature with our thermometer readings, then how can we say that we actually have the gas at a specific temperature? So that's what we mean. Pressure and temperature have a definite value throughout the system. And if that's the case, the state is said to be an equilibrium state. So everything in this course assumes that we're going to do these sort of equilibrium states. Now, is there anything that's not done this way. Yes, in fact, very important systems such as lasers are in non-equilibrium thermodynamics problems. But those are complicated problems are reserved almost exclusively in the domain of physicists these days. So engineers and most other people only when they talk about thermodynamics handle the special case of equilibrium thermodynamics and not the more general case that physicists do of non-equilibrium. So each case, we're going to assume that we don't smack it or jack it up in temp heating and then take the heat away, but that we do something in a reasonably slow and controlled manner so temperature and pressure have definite values in the gas. With that, the gas laws. Most of the gas laws in the 16, 17, and 1800s were done where they took a container of gas that was sealed and closed, and the number of atoms inside that gas did not change over time. And then they adjusted one or more of the various parameters. Boyle's law is a case in which they keep the temperature constant, and they vary only the pressure and the volume. And they found that the pressure times the volume was equal to a constant. Another way sometimes this is written is that the pressure 1 volume 1 is equal to P2 V2 so that if you have pressure 1 and volume 1 and you change the volume then it has a new pressure P2. So this was not actually originally found by Boyle. By the way let, let's make sure we say keeping T and N constant. The constant number of molecules, you didn't have any leaks leaking out the gas, and you kept the temperature of the gas constant. We could graph this. Here's the pressure. Here's the volume. And what you would find is that this would go something like this. proportional to 1 over V because P is equal to the constant divided by the volume. 
The law was initially discovered by Richard Tannelly and Henry Power, but Robert Boyle confirmed their results and actually published it in 1662. Robert Hooke, that we met earlier about Hooke's Law and such, was an assistant of Boyle's, and it was said that he actually built the apparatus by which these experimental results were attained. So, if you keep the temperature the same, and you keep the number of, of atoms the same, the pressure times the volume of gas was experimentally found to be unchanged. Another law that was discovered was to keep the pressure fixed and the number of atoms fixed. So this time we kept P as fixed and N fixed. And when you did that, you get what is known as Charles' Law, though Charles was not the first to publish it. And it says that V is equal to a constant times temperature. But that temperature must be in Kelvin. And I'll talk more about that as we go along. This sometimes is written this way, V1 over T1 at another time is equal to the volume of the gas at a second time with a second temperature. The ratio of the volume to the temperature is a constant. Now let me show you where this experimental graph looks like. Here we have the volume plotted on the y-axis and the temperature, but I'm going to do it in Celsius. And what they found was they had a straight line. And if you follow that line back far enough, it eventually crossed the x-axis at t equal minus 273 Kelvin. Now what this says is that you get a straight line. You could make this v naught and change the formula so that you had v is equal to some constant times t plus some initial volume. But it turns out that for different gases you could get different, with different amounts of gases, you would get different values here, but no matter what you did, no matter how their slopes were, and no matter what their slopes were different pressures, they always came and intersected this point. Which tend to make you believe that not the value at t equals zero Celsius was important, but this value at t equal minus 273, by the way that should be Celsius, not Kelvin, was important. So if you adjust your scale, to a new scale, the Kelvin scale, where the Kelvin scale is simply the Celsius scale plus 273 degrees, you get this graph. Now what exactly this Kelvin scale told us was not understood at the time but at least it made the formulas make sense. No matter what the slopes, all of them came into this point. So that's what you must use for the temperature in any of these gas laws. You can use different scales for pressure and volume, but not for temperature. Temperature must be read in Kelvin, not in Celsius. Charles was interested in these gas laws because of the Mongolian brothers who were doing hot air balloon flights at the time. And so he was interested in how the gas inside the hot air balloon worked. Two other people after his time came about and rediscovered these, John Dalton, an Englishman, and Joseph Louis Gay Lussac, who actually published the result in 1802 and gave credit to Charles saying that he had used Charles's work. So that's why it's called Charles's Law. A third set of experimental evidence was Gay-Lussac's work, and in this case Gay-Lussac again changes the parameters by which you adjust. In this case he decides that he's going to keep volume constant and particle number and just a vet vary pressure and temperature, and he finds that the pressure is proportional to the temperature. So if you increase the pressure, 
you increase the temperature, provided again this temperature is measured in Kelvin. Another way of writing this is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So the pressure of a gas for fixed number of molecules in a fixed volume is directly related to the temperature. And again, had you plotted this T in Celsius, you get something that looks like this, where it crosses at minus 270 degrees Celsius. But if you plot the pressure versus temperature in the Kelvin scale, you get this nice straight line that goes back to the origin. Gay-Lussac found this law in 1809. And the last bit of experimental evidence is what's sometimes called Avogadro's law. And it relates how these properties of the volume deal with the number of particles. And Avogadro's number says the volume of a gas is equal to some constant times the particle number n. Or again, sometimes it's written as V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Equal volumes of gas at the same temperature and pressure have the same number of molecules or equivalently have the same number of moles. Avogadro hypothesized this law in 1811. And you may think that you know, this gets back to Avogadro's number and some other things he did. You might think that it was immediately accepted. It was not. It took over 40 years, in fact, almost 50 years, before chemists actually accepted it until there was enough experimental proof to make them believe in this. Again, you got to realize that the theory of atoms, whether you talk about John Dalton or whatever, when they talk about their understanding in terms of atoms, that is always revisionistic history. The concept of atoms was not fully accepted in the scientific community until 1905. So many things look obvious in retrospect, but they were hotly debated at the time. Now all of this information, all of it, can be combined into a single gas law.